3, 2, 1, ok. Good morning, welcome to uh, this COP27 side event. We are currently in the second week of uh, the COP27 in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Um, I would like uh, to um, welcome our speakers uh, today as we are going to, to deal with the question of uh, nature-based solutions and the building performance and to what extent it can contribute to Nature Positive 2030. Um, before maybe I can introduce myself, so I'm Idris Katada, uh, I'm uh, CEO of uh, Inual Consultancy Environmental Firm and um, I'm uh, the president of uh, Synov Federation Sustainable Development Committee uh, president, and uh, I'm also a member of um, FIDIC um, Sustainable Development Committee, which is uh, the International Federation of Consulting Engineers. And then uh, I would like to introduce uh, the different speakers. So, uh, remotely, um, we have uh, Ewa Iwuzuk, uh, who is uh, currently in Germany, uh, in Berlin. Um, welcome, uh, Ewa. You are uh, um, a coordinator of a uh, research uh, project on uh, nature-based solutions. And then uh, we have uh, Jesus Iglesias Soga, who is uh, in uh, Spain and uh, who is a specialist of um, the global standard for nature-based solutions and also um, EU uh, pact, Global Pact uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, and then uh, in the room, um, I'm pleased to have uh, with us uh, this morning uh, Roland Wiesinger, who is uh, the director of sustainability uh, department at the WBCSD, and uh, he is dedicated to uh, the built environment and um, sustainability. And then uh, we have also uh, Stéphane Poufari. Uh, who is uh, the CEO of Energy uh, 2050 and he, he may uh, want to add some information about uh, his uh, function and activity today. And then, uh, and not the least, uh, we have also uh, Robert Spencer, who is um, the global head uh, of um, ESG practices uh, at ACON. And uh, he's also the vice chair of uh, the Sustainable Development Committee uh, at FIDIC. Um, and uh, now uh, I would like to, um, well, uh, to set the scene and to provide uh, our audience uh, a definition of uh, what uh, nature-based solution is and also what nature positive 2030 means. I would like to, to invite, um, as a first speaker, um, Jesus, uh, if uh, you would like to introduce what a nature-based solution is, I'm going to, to shift the slide in order to, to um, take the advantage of the picture. Um, yes, so uh, Jesus, uh, I let you uh, introduce uh, what a nature-based solution is uh, and with a focus on the building stage. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thanks a lot Idris, organizers and COP27 for the opportunity. This is Jesus Iglesias from MBS Climate. So the IUCN defines nature-based solutions or MBS as actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural or modified ecosystems in order to effectively and adaptively uh, address societal challenges, the likes of climate change, food or water security, while simultaneously, and this is important, providing human well-being and benefits to biodiversity. To help the guide the design, implementation, assessment and continuous improvement of MBS projects, the IUCN led a broad consultation of different stakeholders around the world uh, a couple of years ago, which resulted in a global standard for MBS published in 2020. It is structured around eight criteria, you can see them in the picture, uh, each with a number of indicators. Criteria number one is about addressing societal challenges, as we said. Number two is about design and scale. The scale of the solution has to be that of the problem. Number three is biodiversity net gain. 
Number four, economic feasibility. The project has to be economically feasible. Number five, it's about inclusive governance all throughout the process. Number six, the trade-offs have to be balanced. Number seven, management has to be adaptive. That is, it has to evolve with the problem. And number eight, mainstreaming and sustainability. This is basically about being able to replicate these solutions everywhere with proper adaptation to local context. But well, we're speaking about buildings today. So how does the standard apply to buildings? Well, just briefly and to open the discussion, uh, while you can have green facades or green rooftops in buildings, in order to actually tackle something as big as climate change, it's all matter of scale, right? So therefore, the most effective MBS approach would be to incorporate green buildings as part of something larger. Uh, we're talking about city-wide or landscape-wide, depending on whether you're in an urban or rural context, green corridors. So buildings as part of green corridors that actually significantly lower temperature in the city or in the rural area, filter pollution, air pollution, provide ecological connectivity and integrity for biodiversity, that's important, boost the local economy, and so they're embedded in a vibrant local economy, and are managed inclusively, that is engaging all key stakeholders in the process. That's a little bit the framework for today's uh, discussion. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Jesus. Uh, it was uh, very short but very compact, and uh, it helps us to, to understand uh, what uh, a nature-based solution can be and how it could be uh, applied at uh, the building level. And uh, um, in order to, to complete uh, the, the definition, the scene, uh, I invite uh, Roland Zinker to, to, uh, to help understanding what nature positive 2030 uh, means. I'm going also to shift. Uh, Shall I take it? The slide. Uh, I think that the next slide is yours. Uh, yes, this one. Just this one. It's not the first one, though. No. Let me. Uh, do that. It misses a couple slides, but. Uh, I, I just have one. Just to, to say the scene, if you oh, okay. could just introduce what nature positive ah, I, is. I just, see. Just thank you. Yeah. the definition. Of course. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. I just wanted to briefly say why am I here with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is because we work with global companies on how do we create a net zero carbon but also nature positive future as well as tackling inequality. These are the three imperatives that all our member companies uh, are working on. And so the big question on nature positive is, what does it mean? And there we are basing ourselves on the work that uh, a large group of scientific organizations, NGOs, has done with the global goal for nature. So it basically says that we need to halt and reverse loss of nature to become nature positive. So zero net loss as of 2020 so today we're 2022 all actors have to work on no more net loss net positive by 2030 and then full recovery by 2050 and just to briefly um, point to something that will be launched today i think it's a session a bit later where um, we get a bit more um, input on the nature positive language it's a global goal to halt and reverse nature loss by 2030 and achieve full recovery by 2050, where thriving ecosystems and nature-based solutions support human societies and help tackle climate change. So very much in line with um, what Jesus has also presented. And afterwards, I can discuss a little bit more what that means now for business and, and how they can contribute to that. Yeah. Th thank you very much, uh, Roland. And, uh, as um, we have now uh, some explanations about what a uh, nature-based solution is and what a uh, nature-positive 2030 uh, means, uh, at least we have, uh, uh, I would say, the main f features uh, of uh, this topic. Uh, now I would like to, to invite um, Robert Spencer to, to provide uh, from his experience how um, it, it can nature-based solutions can be implemented at uh, the urban and also at the, the building level. So please, uh, Robert, th the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going backwards on time. Let's go forwards. 
There it is. Great. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining. What I'm going to do is uh, get a bit technical uh, here and, and just look at one of the challenges for nature-based solutions in buildings. And that is that nature is a domain professionally that's largely occupied by biologists, ecologists, landscape architects, landscape managers, and so on. Whereas buildings is largely occupied by building engineers and mechanical electrical engineers and facilities managers and so on. And the challenge is how do you convince the people who design and operate and manage the facilities of the buildings to take on board a whole new set of technologies around understanding nature and integrating nature into the building fabric and the building's operations. So I'm going to talk about a guide that was developed by my colleague Ash Welch. And um, we're going to look at some of the uh, implications of that process. So it's a technical guide that's specifically designed to give uh, engineering and uh, technical professionals much more confidence in understanding how to put in place nature-based solutions, in particular things like loading factors, irrigation, water supply, um, sunlight, and all these things that actually natural systems need to function effectively, and uh, which not, might not be um, second nature to our engineering colleagues. So that's really the, the, uh, the focus here. And so I think you can see from this slide that we've got a definition there, which Hazes has obviously given us already. And so we're going to be focusing on item two, bringing nature into cities. Um, so you've really got uh, three options here, living walls, living roofs, and sustainable drainage systems. And the, the challenge is that there is a sort of status quo at the moment that, oh, we'll, we'll try a nature-based solution if we've got a client with an extra bit of money and uh, we'll, we'll try a basic sort of uh, you know, habitat system. Um, and I think that the, the thing is we need to move on from that and get into a, a bit more of an effective um, an approach. Um, <clears throat> so that picture of this sort of um, moss-like uh, growth on the, on the bottom right is sedum. Uh, cheap, easy to, to, to establish, but absolutely useless for biodiversity and any of the other sorts of um, uh, sort of co-benefits that we want from our nature-based solution. So we're really looking for a much more complex approach. So at the, at the moment, we've got these off-the-peg solutions, a bit of an aspiration. Ecologists and landscape architects even don't know how some of these systems work. And designing for biodiversity and ecosystem services a new skill set for the engineers. So how do we get around that? We need a new holistic approach. So we need to think about sustainability, and this is really one of the key things around that in cities, as Hayes has already identified, is uh, natural systems in cities can contribute a huge amount to summer comfort, overheating reduction, shading, and cooling benefits. You've also got biodiversity net gain, so that's an approach, and I will use some examples from the British uh, system here, because we've got quite an advanced biodiversity net gain regulatory system now, uh, so I'll give some examples from that. Um, and, and there you can see a baseline that's looking to uh, improve biodiversity on the site, which is a new requirement. You've got an urban greening factor, which is part of the biodiversity net gain. So that says, you know, you need to hit for a commercial building over 30 or 0 0.30 in your greening factor, or for a residential building over 4.40. And you arrive at that by looking at how much intensive green roof you've got, how much uh, roofing you've got, how much paving. So all these different options for integrating uh, natural systems into the building, they get multiplied together and you end up with the greening factor. So that's quite an innovative approach. You are constrained by space, of course, in the cities. I know Hazus was saying we need um, city and landscape level approaches, um, but that requires a huge amount of coordination. So th there can be a lot of work done at the single development or multi-development level. So in the bottom hand uh, left corner, you'll see that there's the... Um, <coughs> the QR code, so you can immediately dip in and start to have a look at the, uh, the guidance system if you like. So I'm going to just give some highlights from the design process now. Um, and the key thing to think about is, yes, what are these primary functions that we actually want from the nature-based system? What outcome do we want from the fully functioning nature-based system? So you could have a, a number. 
And that's why nature-based systems are so good. They typically provide many more benefits than a single hard infrastructure solution. So here you could choose from stormwater drainage, air filtration, health and well-being, urban cooling, and so on, uh, all the way around to biodiversity and recreation. So these are the typical things that you'd look for in a, in a design specification. How much shading can you achieve? What sort of soil types do you need for the, the, um, the vegetation? What sort of average temperature are you dealing with? And that's important both from the point of view of what the um, species can handle, but also what sort of uh, temperature reductions you might look to achieve from the, um, from the implementation of the solution. And then local priority species. So how can you improve biodiversity in the local area? How can you select species that are going to improve pollinators, for example, and things like that? So let's click on. So, and one of, one of the key concepts that's driving this is something called biophilia. Um, you may have seen that. It's, it's a way of trying to um, create infrastructure solutions that mimic the natural systems uh, organization. So, uh, a little bit about the, the new biodiversity net gain requirements from the UK. So, these, these are easily downloadable from the UK website, but it is interesting to look at them. So, living roofs are a fantastic opportunity. So, Again, with that option, you can look at, uh, have you got an extensive roof, or do you have only a small space where you need to do an intensive uh, intervention? Um, and then what, what the guide gives you is some comparisons there, and you can see what the sort of data outcomes are. There's quite a, a useful tabulation in the guide, um, which gives you understanding of the distinctiveness and the condition and the time to target. Uh, in other words, how long will it take to establish? and these sorts of things. So the guide's very useful for actually giving you an insight into what outcome you will get from the specific nature-based solution you've put in place. Uh, combining solar is, is, is being introduced a good deal as well on solar, on, on rooftops where you have good aspect uh, for sunlight. Um, so uh, these living roof examples are providing you know, different levels of biodiversity units per hectare. As you can see, the grassland wildflower is giving a biodiversity unit of 6.73 with a good condition, down to the extensive green roof with a mixture of wildflowers and sedum, um, only 4.82. So it does make a di big difference in terms of the quality and condition of the habitat as to what species mix you're using. Living walls, I'm going to go quite fast because there's a lot of, un unlike the other presentations, I'm going to go quite deep into the technical details. So we are going through the slides quite fast. I'm just trying to get this one to move on. It's a bit unresponsive. No. Sure if it's still working. It's okay. There we go. It's worked. Uh, so ground-based green walls, this is, this is where you need to have a growing medium at the bottom of the wall, and then you're looking for um, st structures that the, the plant life can hold onto that carries them up the wall. Um, and then you've got a modular system there with built-in irrigation, um, so you need to be thinking about the um, maintenance and uh, water supply issues when you're designing these ones. And there you go, there's some different... Uh, approaches there for walls, the ground-based green wall and the facade-based green wall, giving you those different outcomes. And you can see here, again, the biodiversity outcomes there for those different design processes, ranging from sort of just over three to just over two. So you are not quite as high as the, the green rooftops options, but there are some, some good, uh, good outcomes there if the species selection is good and you can afford to look after it. And the final sort of segment is around uh, sustainable um, urban drainage systems. I expect people are more familiar with these. You see them around a lot more, and I think these are the sorts of things that um, Jesus was uh, referring to as well, where you can get more of an interlinkage between uh, design developments in cities and also create much larger spaces for recreation and well-being outside of buildings um, but adjacent to them. And so these sorts of opportunities, uh, you could look at rain gardens where you're looking at how, how you can actually absorb extra water flow during increasingly common uh, extreme rainfall events that we're all uh, at, at, you know, having to deal with. And so again, you've got some, uh, some options here for a bioswale or a rain garden uh, with the sustainable urban drainage system as well. Again, giving you a bit of a readout on what the outcomes could be there for those different types of interventions. These are some SUDS examples, and you can see the biodiversity uh, outcomes there. 
uh, quite a poor one there with a low species mix, and then a much higher one there with a good condition and quite a range of biodiversity from the uh, species introduced. So this is very much a holistic approach. So we're moving from that early let's try it if we can, a bit of a sort of hobby approach to actually let's integrate this thoroughly into building engineering design systems. Must consider at a very early stage of design, otherwise you lose the opportunity to integrate the building, into the integrate nature into the building. You need this range of specialists, so it is a bit more complex at the early stage to actually design the nature-based solution because as you can see, you need to bring together ecologists, landscape architects, engineers, GIS experts, and drainage specialists. That's my little timer saying I've done my 10 minutes, so I have to wrap up. Um, but you do end up with a much wider cityscape opportunity, as um, Hezus was alluding to. You get multifunctional green space, and all of this underpins a wider sustainability goal that some of the developer clients might have, which you can help them achieve. So. Um, this is the uh, technical requirements. There is a sort of there's two there's two guidance documents actually that ACOM contributed to the company I work for. One was the sort of introduction to the nature-based solutions, and then the technical requirements guide is much more for the engineering professions to actually understand things like loading and water requirements and that sort of thing. So getting much more into the detail. Uh, there it is. Um, it was prepared by ACOM and ANS Global and sponsored by Briam. You can download the guide there with the uh, QR code if you would like to. I'll leave that there for a second. That's me done, Idris. Sorry, it's a bit of a, a race, but we got there, I think, in terms of the key content. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Robert. It was very comprehensive and uh, gives a very uh, interesting overview of uh, how to implement natural solutions at the urban and buildings um, level. And uh, having say, said that, um, we can also understand today that uh, company which has a portfolio of buildings can also uh, address this topic and uh, moreover to some extent they can introduce this criteria of natural based solutions in their supply chain to some extent so how can they impact not only directly in their portfolio of assets but also on the indirect impact uh, on the value chain and I let uh, Roland Zinker provide uh, its uh, perspective on the corporate um, approach. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies. I need to go over here because otherwise I, I cannot see. Um. Here we go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, excellent input, Robert. Thank you. Um, that was really, really interesting how we embed these nature-based solutions. I, I will just take a step back now indeed as um, Idris has said and maybe add a bit more complexity uh, to the discussion, but also really this question, how do we move the whole sector to embrace nature positive and implement these solutions that we are seeing? So I introduced that at the beginning. Um, we are a global member-led uh, network of over 200 companies um, these companies have committed to implement net zero carbon, nature positive strategies and also become more diverse, more inclusive and tackle human rights as part of WBCSD membership commitment. And I'd say that the journey to nature positive is really only just starting. Um, I referred at the beginning to this overview. We have a global goal for nature that was developed a few years ago by a global group of scientists, environmental NGOs, as well as businesses. And this is the roadmap for everybody. Now, of course, we still need to better understand what does it mean, no uh, net loss of nature? What is net positive by 2030? And what is full recovery by 2050? But we start seeing that common language that we are all uh, working together on. So. If we look at the business uh, lens of this, to achieve this goal, the collective impacts from regenerative and restorative actions must outweigh those from reducing, uh, uh, from avoiding uh, nature loss, and individual companies must contribute to the larger outcome. So it's almost comparable with the discussion on net zero carbon. 
So how do I as a company contribute to that overall goal of creating a net zero built environment? How do I contribute to a net po nature positive built environment? And so at WBCSD, we currently have several working groups on this topic. And in particular, we have started a group in the built environment. Really, what do we mean? Um, we want to support businesses in the whole value chain to scale up actions uh, very much to the point Robert has shown us by providing that shared definition and supporting them in, in adopting that. And really, it's still also about raising awareness. Companies are more and more comfortable and talking about the net zero and scope one, two, three emissions. They're head on tackling that. I think on nature, we are still in that awareness raising stage. And actually, well, what do I need to measure? And, and how do I measure it? That is fundamental for the business community. And obviously, we don't do that alone. Um, if we look at the frameworks that have already been created, we're very active with the science-based targets network. Um, they're not only working with businesses, but also with cities, which for this topic is particularly important because the building sector is in cities typically. So we really need to work together. And then TNFD, which is the equivalent to the TCFD, a lot of acronyms. TCFD is the task force on climate related financial disclosures and TNFD is on nature, uh, as you can read uh, there, as well as the Capitals Coalition that worked on uh, the uh, biodiversity framework. So our first step last year was the building blocks. This helps businesses navigate this space. Uh, we have issued a practitioner's guide on how you commit, how you measure, and then how you act and transform as well as report as a company. Now, if we take this again to the built environment, it's important that we look at the different scales of impact. So on the one hand, um, this spatial scale, where I think, Robert, you have shown that really with your example, it's on site, it's to surroundings, but it's also the upstream. I don't think we have looked so far at all the impacts from the extraction of materials from the transportation to construction sites, etc. So as we do that for whole life carbon in the carbon discussion, we also need to look at whole life nature impacts and biodiversity. And then obviously on the temporal scale, again, how do we involve everyone on this journey? It requires new skills. It requires new people to come to the discussion and, and that is complex. And then obviously from a company perspective, the direct operations and how does that impact my value chain and ultimately the system? So, as I said, we are at the beginning of this journey. We were hoping uh, to come out with our first kind of baseline report for this COP, but we'll have it for the COP CBD uh, 15 in Montreal. Um, and it's really looking at the upstream, the direct and the downstream impacts and dependencies on nature. So really engaging companies from all the contributing sectors. So whether they are manufacturers of building materials, forestry companies, developers, construction companies, but then also importantly, finance and developers and the end users. And very, very similar to what we have created in terms of how we tackle life cycle carbon to create that common language. Um, so yeah, I'll skip this. This is just, it will be in the slides that we can circulate the journey we are on. And if you're interested to um, eventually read this inside paper, um, here you can leave your contacts. Uh, and then we can uh, circulate that once it's available. So thank you, uh, Idris, for giving me the opportunity to introduce this. Yes. Thank you very much for this uh, additional approach for how to embed nature-based solutions in our current uh, practices, um, either at uh, a building level, either at a company level. And um, we, we expected uh, to have also a presentation with a more, I would say, um, local community perspective. Uh, we won't have uh, this opportunity today, but uh, hopefully we will have that uh, in another event. But um, I would like to now to, um, to, to uh, invite uh, Jesus uh, Sogar to, to explain uh, how it is possible to, to support the innovation in this field, how it is possible to, to support the empowerment of people who would like to, to develop some new 
NBS solutions. And so, um, Jesus, the floor is yours. I shift to your slide, and please. Uh, can see. All right, thank you, Idris. So let me take you now to central northern Spain, to a rural area called the Ribera del Duero, which is actually a world famous wine region. Yet it suffers from tremendous rural depopulation that forces young people to migrate to big cities uh, down south, like Madrid, or up north, like Bilbao in the Basque Country. So this translates into a downward spiral with phenomenal challenges like the disappearance of basic social services such as hospitals or schools and communication infrastructure like regional trains or high-speed internet. So with all this human talent leaving these places, who is actually going to stay and preserve culture, grow food, manage the forest and care for biodiversity? Who is going to do that? Well, here's where nature-based solutions come into play in the rural areas. They help us build a nature-positive economy that creates decent jobs and livelihoods in rural communities through, for example, green corridors around, across, and between small towns, regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, reforestation, rewilding, also important, or ecological restoration of degraded ecosystems, such as, for example, wetlands. So, in the next slide, uh, already there, let's get down to earth, let's get down to specifics. Let me present you a very concrete project that seeks to leverage nature based solutions and economic localization, also important, to drive climate resilience and at the same time rural repopulation of these rural areas, particularly my hometown here of Aranda del Duero, the capital of this wine region of mine. So the project is called uh, Riverin, Riverin Doris, and is led by my company, MBS Climate. And it's basically a social innovation ecosystem consisting of a core co-working space, a pioneering MBS incubator for social enterprises working on MBS, and in the second phase, we're also going to develop a co-housing for researchers, social entrepreneurs, artists, and any, any, really any change maker willing to come over here and contribute to mainstreaming NBS in, in rural areas. So besides, given the fact that my brother has an ecological winery right next to it in the same block, we're also going to cater his handmade wines in our, at our events to, in order to ground the community in the land where it belongs to. That's important, they're grounded. So on top of it all, the ecosystem will be powered by a local currency in order to initially foster exchanges between members of the community, but eventually will expand it to the whole local economy. In terms of buildings, which is the topic of today, as you can see in the picture, the ecosystem itself is located between a green area in the city center and also a park along the river, which actually connects with nearby forests. So as we are currently refurbishing the co-working space and build the co house we will build the co-house, the co-housing building later on, we'll make sure that endogenous vegetation is present everywhere and is part of this larger green corridor at the city level. That will not only lower temperatures in the summer, but also reintroduce biodiversity back into the city. And why not? Even wildlife. So imagine that. So thank you very much everyone and COP27, let's do this. Back to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jesus, for this uh, very um, local experience and uh, projects uh, currently uh, implemented and uh, hope that it, it will uh, develop the wild uh, life in the, in the next decades. <laughs> it will be a positive contribution in this case. And um, I would like now to, to give um, the, the floor to uh, Ewa uh, Iwuzuk, who will be able to, to speak about um, some uh, policy measures and also as, um, an atlas of uh, NBS solutions which has been developed under uh, Horizon 2020 uh, EU research project. And uh, now this project is uh, at the end, if I well understood and it has de been developed um, with the Latin American, some Latin American countries. So it will be um, interesting also to have a perspective from uh, other locations in, in the world. Uh, so I give you the, the floor um, over to you, Ewa, and I let, take you, I let you take the, the screen with your own uh, computer in order that it will be easier for you to, to, to have your your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Idris. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it now as well. Um, yes, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Eva Ivashuk. I will just clarify that um, I'm not a coordinator of the Interlace project, uh, just one of the many team members. 
I work for Ecologic Institute, which is a Berlin-based policy environmental think tank. And here at Ecologic, we do coordinate the Interlace, which is a EU-funded research project that supports urban ecosystem restoration in cities in Europe and Latin America. So ecosystem restoration is also a concept that uh, relates to the concept na nature positive future, because we're looking at how to reverse ecosystem loss in cities, um, how to halt it and then how to reverse it, how to restore those ecosystems. So I think we're here very much on the same page. And today I would like to talk about some of the work we do in our project. The project is still halfway in its duration, so it's still going to run for a couple more a uh, couple more years, but we have already achieved quite a lot. Um, I'm just trying to change the slide. Yes, here we go. Uh, so what I would really like to talk about today, I think we heard a very convincing case from the previous speakers. Why do we need nature-based solutions? Why do we need to halt and reverse biodiversity and nature loss? We also uh, heard from Robert, what are the concrete solutions that can be implemented in urban contexts? Um, what are the technical requirements to implement those? And Robert also mentioned uh, some policy frameworks that are being introduced by the British government in order to create a favorable environment for those things to become not a nice to have, but rather something that is becoming more mainstream in the building sector. Uh, and here, a crucial piece of the puzzle are the concrete policy instruments. Uh, in the case of my presentation, mostly the ones developed at the local level that can act as enables or barriers to adoption of nature-based solutions in building sector and in other sectors. So what I mean by that? Uh, actors in construction sector, uh, I'm mentioning those because this is we're in the buildings pavilion, uh, and have a lot of colleagues from that sector, operate in the legislative and policy environment. Uh, and this environment is created uh, by laws that mandate or forbid certain approaches, mechanisms that may maybe require compensation when vegetation is lost during construction, grants and subsidies to promote concrete solutions such as green roofs, for example, or taxes and payments that may make not installing nature-based solutions very costly. Uh, but policy instruments can also include uh, programs of collaboration between municipalities or public-private partnerships, uh, or, for, for example, instruments that connect key actors to knowledge and expertise that is required to implement nature-based solutions. And what uh, me and my team are doing in the Interlace project uh, is we wanted to bring different interested actors to concrete policy instruments that exist all around the world, that are being developed all around the world, primarily in Europe and Latin America, because that's where we work in our project, but we also try to source from different areas of the world to understand local policy solutions that are already being implemented, that have been successful, that have concrete results, and that have a potential to be replicated in different places in order to make uh, bringing nature-based solutions to uh, built environments and other urban environments, something that is necessary, something that is easy, something that is affordable, something that is attractive, and something that eventually becomes mainstream. Uh, the database is available, although it's still in a beta version, it will look very different when we finally launch it next year, but you can already browse, uh, for example, of, of, of over 200 policy instruments from Europe, Latin America, and beyond. Uh, and in the database, you can find detailed description of these instruments, links to all the documentation, but also factors that make the instrument successful, information on financing, information on lessons learned in design, implementation, and governance of those uh, instruments. And uh, as uh, Roland mentioned, the uh, import of nature positive development, we actually also look at which instruments specifically foster urban ecosystem restoration. So in this this re reverse in the loss of nature. Uh, so the target group for the Atlas, definitely local governments who want to get inspired about what others are doing, but really also many other actors that may want to lobby with the local governments to introduce policy frameworks that make introducing nature-based solutions at building level easier, more affordable and mainstream. To kind of point out the relevance to today's topic, uh, we if you filter through we have different categories. If you filter through 
scale of application for the uh, instruments that target nature-based solutions and building level. We have 72 relevant instruments from all over the world. Uh, I will provide a DMQ QR code to the database so you'll be able to explore it yourself. Um, but I wanted to give you a few examples of the instruments that you can find there. The database itself is much more rich information, uh, but I wanted to, I think, really make a point maybe that the instruments are not just laws and strategies and regulations, but can be also understood a little bit more widely. Uh, so I'll give you three examples. Uh, first of all, one of the tools we described is an eco efficiency tool uh, introduced in Quito, where building developers can develop buildings that are 50 to 100% higher when it comes to number of floors, as opposed to what is included in the uh, land use plans for that given area, if uh, they integrate solutions to increase environmental performance of these buildings. And there's a scoring system that determines exactly how much denser or higher the buildings have been. And in this scoring system, green infrastructure solutions uh, for rainwater management and thermal comfort, but also vegetation that kind of has a, an effect beyond the building scale uh, are scored particularly highly. So it's a very clear incentive for the developers to introduce nature-based solutions. And the design of the instrument was consulted with local architects, engineers, and actors in construction sector to make it fit for purpose. So it allows uh, the city of Quito to basically have more nature-based solutions implemented with private financing while providing very clear incentive for the developers to do so. So that's kind of at the individual building level. Uh, in London, on the other hand, the city has been working with so-called uh, business improvement districts, which are collectives of local businesses. This is not just a London-based concept. There are 1,500 of those business improvement districts all around the world. Um, and in the case of this project, the, there were green infrastructure audits uh, that identified potential for introducing nature-based solutions at building and street levels in those uh, business districts. So usually those were like commercial streets, high streets um, in certain areas. But they also delivered a very clear case for the local businesses of benefits of introducing nature-based solutions. So it showed that nature-based solutions can increase the attractiveness of the area for visitors, for customers, uh, for workers, and can also, uh, of course, improve the areas by reducing flood risk, improving air quality, increasing biodiversity. And as a result of this work, and uh, there were a lot of accompanying activities providing also specific guidance how to bring nature-based solutions, which potential nature-based solution can be used. Uh, more than 100 new nature-based solutions installations uh, were implemented, leveraging over 4 million uh, British pounds in private funding. And because in here the design was to work with coalitions of businesses rather than individual businesses, that allowed for pooling of costs and for efforts, leading to an increased overall impact. Finally, an example from a city where I am based, Berlin. Um, Berlin actually has a legal requirement for all newly built development to manage the water on site. So they're not allowed to um, take the rainwater to sewage at all because Berlin has a mixed sewage system, which is unfortunately unable to, um, to take more rainwater. So those new properties all have to be disconnected. And uh, as Robert mentioned, this is not so straightforward. Those solutions are not that easy. Therefore, uh, Berlin has um, convened a rainwater agency. It is an institution that serves as a platform to connect a wide range of actors and engage them in different activities to make city rainproof. And basically they work, first of all, as a consultancy. So they advise builders, homeowners, building owners. Also, they work on all the major urban development projects in Berlin on how to introduce fit for purpose decentralized water management approaches uh, when it comes to technical matters, funding, legal matters, also finding suitable contractors to concretely develop the works. And they focus on kind of high quality nature-based solutions that bring multiple functions beyond only um, rainwater management, as was mentioned by previous speakers. They provide training and networking opportunities between those different actors, which in fact make sure that actors in the public administration, the private sector can speak the same language when it comes to uh, nature-based solutions. 
they have an online knowledge database, but they also commit, uh, co convene thematic working groups of professionals and scientists to address issues that don't yet have established solutions. So creating new solutions for this very complicated context of Berlin, where the developers, no matter the size of the plot, have to manage all the rainwater on site. Um, so those were just few examples. We have not yet conducted a scientific analysis of the 200 examples we have collected, so please don't quote me on that, but we can already see that when it comes to uh, policy instruments that are successful that have big impact, the important components are the fact that they are designed in collaboration with key stakeholders. Um, they take into account the multifunctional nature of nature-based solutions to optimize delivery of not one, but multiple benefits. They promote high quality, locally appropriate nature-based solutions. Um, this is very important. Jesus was mentioning the definition of nature-based solutions, which mentions that, uh, you know, not every urban greening will be nature-based solutions. They have to perform certain functions. They have to be uh, locally adapted and able to perform over long time. Those projects also consider financial sustainability and opportunities to leverage private finance and include learning components. So they monitor, they evaluate, and they have some self-reflection components in them so that they can continue to revise and improve the projects. Uh, so I hope I have uh, made you interested in, in that work and you will be willing to explore more. Uh, so the QR code on the left, you can browse the Urban Governance Atlas. As I said, it's a beta version, which means that uh, the design is not final and also some instruments are in English, some are in Spanish. Eventually it will be a multilingual tool, for sure in English and Spanish, but will probably work to provide several language versions. Uh, and the Atlas is still open. We're still looking for around 40 more contributions. Therefore, if you work for a local government or if you are aware of any very good solutions in your city that you believe could be featured to inspire others. Uh, I invite you to use the QR code on the right to understand how you can submit your policy instrument and how we can work together to uh, also inspire others and bring those interesting solutions to the fore. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to this event today. Thank you very much, uh, Ewa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ewa, um, for these uh, examples of uh, policy measures and also uh, examples of uh, NBS um, in Latin America and in Europe. And it shows also how uh, um, complex it is and uh, it requires a, a strong will to, to implement uh, these, uh, these solutions. And um, as we are up uh, of implementation, uh, these are very inspiring examples. Uh, at the same time, uh, maybe th these solutions, uh, these so na nature-based solutions, uh, are not well or enough described in the national determined contributions, uh, in the different uh, reporting um, documents and policy documents currently. Um, so from your perspective, um, Stéphane Poufari, we'd like to, to provide us uh, an insight of uh, how it's going on. Thank you. Un, deux. Un, deux. So hello, everyone. So um, no. Okay, so I'm, s I'm more than happy to be here and um, thank you Idris for organizing this uh, interesting session. I'm Stéphane Poufari, the CEO of Energy Not 50. We are an NGO working on the systemic approach of development since quite a long time. And we are working on the, let's say, the key pillar of the transform transformational patterns to a low carbon future. And both with governments, local governments, and also multi-stakeholder coalition, we are members of the Global ABC, and also, by the way, we are working on the built environment since quite a lot of, uh, let's say, decades. And uh, we were discussing with Roland 
Before the Global ABC, we, we launched the first reports on buildings in climate. It was in the Copenhagen COP, COP15, and it was buildings count for climate. And a few years after, we launched also a common carbon metrics. It was really in advance, and now everybody is speaking about metrics, and it's good, but buildings is far beyond what it should be. So again, we are working on a quite a number of topics. We have a nexus approach. And uh, by the way, we support, for example, some governments to design their NDC, their adaptation plan, their uh, request for the Green Climate Fund. We work with local governments to the territorialization of NDC, for example. And we have quite a lot of, let's say, projects. So by the way, jumping to this point, I will try to just, let's say, open some, sorry, I need to have this one also. It's not working. Yes, I would just open some question at the end, because if you just look on this wall, some figure about the African continent. And just one question, do you really think that our trends now will make these guys develop a low carbon building and integrating natural based solution in countries where traditionally they were low carbon and also efficient? Can you really think of policy frameworks will support these guys without locking effect? The answer is clearly no. And we are here in COP27, so it's wonderful. Yes, we are all doing a lot of activities, but we have quite, quite a number of questions. First, we don't need any more to demonstrate anything. We have enough figure, enough best practice, if not, let's say, evaluation. And even we need maybe one more information, avoided cost, with the co-benefit. This is very interesting. Why? Because it should demonstrate that at the end, it is not 5.4 billion US dollar. It will cost for Africa at least one day to have something to be, let's say, okay, good enough, maybe 10 billion. Because at the end, they will have to refurbish, to repair, and to pay also for additional resources. So at the end, it makes no sense. Just to keep this figure here, we can go globally. So. We all know also, it has been recalled in the Global Status Report, that policy are far beyond what they should be. And even when they commit, they are not implemented. We can look to building codes, we can look to NDC, we can look to everything. We have sometimes some commitments. No, even we have the long-term strategy. For those you know, it's very interesting. It's 2050 to be comparable with country commitment with the neutrality. Wonderful. Some of them are mentioning building and cities. Wonderful. But at the end, when you go back to the, let's say, frameworks for implementation, it's not so good. So here is it some figure. So if some of you want to recall and to have a look to the conclusion, they are the same since decade. We want a mix of blah, blah, blah. We repeat. We know that. But at the end, what can we, what can we do better to reinforce, let's say, the implementation side? You remember the example IWA was presenting, most of them were with private funds. So it's good when it's possible. It's good when you have backup somewhere, some policy framework to support the initial step. But at the end, how can we scale up? This is the question. So here we have the conclusion of this one. We have also in the Global ABC a working group on adaptation. And look, adaptation and resilience is part of the change if. And here again, we have a lot of things. What does it mean? to work, for example, on the co-benefit, both adaptation and medication and resilience. This is obvious, but on practical, it's quite complex. And we will see why, and we will see how we can scale up sometimes. So, for example, we need to consider nature-based solution. This is a good recommendation. Nobody can say it makes no sense for many, many issues. But sometimes the benefit is beyond the building. So if you have, let's say, you know, you reduce the uh, heat wave, you reduce whatever, you reduce the albedo, do, do, it's wonderful. But at the end, who will pay for this common benefit? So this is complex sometimes. So why we need prescriptive? It is to share the common constraint and the common benefit. Otherwise, guys will not invest so large, you know. And we have this issue many times. For those who remember, before, let's say, the new Article 6 cooperation mechanism, we were working on NAMA. And we have supports to design NAMA methodology on cities level and at building levels. And we had only two or three of them which were successful. Because at the end, going to the systemic approach to incorporate this kind of solution is rather complex. 
because we need methodology to report. And you remember, NAMA was the same methodology, more or less, than the MDP, the CDM. So at the end, it was complex. And even with now the new mechanisms, it will remain complex, and even worse. So going back to some, let's say, life cycle analysis of the building, we know the whole process. So some question can be also part of recommendation. Is it because it is too complex? Okay, we know the Highlands approach, the complexity. Frankly speaking, from my perspective, it is not complex. We have exactly, let's say, the full analysis of who is doing what, who is belonging to what, who is remaining, you know, needs something to support his activities. This is clear. We know the story since decade. So is it a lack of understanding? Frankly, I'm not convinced. Because we are advocating since so long even for the bottom-up approach for NDC, for NAPS, for whatever the plan you design, we have discussion with guys. But, for example, now we have a curriculum in Lomé, in the African School of Architects. No. This is a nine edition. And guys are complaining because we teach them solution, but they don't have access to the market with this solution. And if they implement, they will lose any call. So this is something complex. How can when we do, you know, the eggs and the, you know, it's, it's something complex. But by the way, so I'm not so sure it's a lack of understanding. I will say it's a lack of opportunity. And at the end, the building sectors need, let's say, a support to transform constraints into opportunities. This is clear. So nature-based solution, no, there are the new entry one. It's very interesting. Everybody is focusing on this. But by the way, nature-based solution, it's only entering in the NDC process. It is not fully, let's say, endorsed. It is in another convention, where the building is not here. It is in the Biodiversity Convention, when we have a lot of tools to work on strategy. And even if we have a lot of methodology to support buildings and nature-based solution in the NDC, I will s show you some of them. And you will see almost all of them is taking into account the constraint of building. So what is very important? We need to fix the cost. We need to fix the cost of opportunity. Why guys are not doing that? It is crazy because time is against us. And we all know this is a locking effect. We have already an EPCC report, I think it was in 2012, if I remember well, on buildings especially. And the lady was working and especially she was calculating the cost of the locking effect. You know the process. You do something wrong today, you will have to refurbish one day. So the locking effect, this is not incorporating nature-based solution in a project. Because at the end, one day, you will have to pay somewhere. It's it absolutely obvious. So going back to some policy, uh, it's already, let's say, OK. I will go to this one. I already said that. So now we need to push in the political agenda. Guys already incorporate the NDC. That's clear. But at the end, they just forget sometimes the national adaptation plan. And also sometimes they are just absolutely out of the national biodiversity strategy and action plan. Because we have many projects which are very interesting, like fooding cities, nature in cities, many, many things. And at the end, they are connected to this kind of plan. You know, because there is a competition. We just think about the building to endorse and to incorporate solution, but on the other side, the building is in competition with the land use, whatever we are doing at the district and also at the le level of the planning. So at the end, when you incorporate this kind of issue, you can use, when you speak about a rooftop, for me, it is not an issue only to produce energy or to produce some green vegetables. It's also something to, at the end, decrease the competition between the different approach. And it has to be reflected, because why I'm speaking about this one? Because as soon as you go to this trajectory, you speak about additionality. What does it mean? You need to measure. For gas, you know, we have two registries here in this convention. One for adaptation, one for mitigation. And they are separate. And so far, they're not speaking about the same indicators. It's really complex. And up to now, guys, we, we have designed, uh, let's say, a national evaluation system in two countries, and we were recreating some indicators to measure. It was crazy, because it was not reflected adaptation properly in the NDC, even in the conditionality part. So it was really challenging. But why I'm speaking about this document? Because at the end, they will be accountable. They will have the position to measure. 
and to call for, set, let's say, at least some support or some policy to implement and to make measurements. We need to be in position to demonstrate additionality. And this is maybe the missing part of nature-based solution. We need to find a way to calculate the benefit. Otherwise, it would be really complex to push these guys to do that and to make something compulsory. This is very important. So we need data. And also, at the end, it will be a question of money. I'm not so sure the private sector will endorse the full transformational patterns. It is almost not possible. Even if we know that in some cases, even in Africa, in small island states, let's say a building which is well designed makes sense and has the value. That's clear. For renting, for selling, that's clear. But even if you want to have a labeling somewhere, you need to pay for it. So again, it's something to be complex. And depending on the writing scheme, you will have something different. So it's complex again. So why I'm speaking about creating a value? Because there are mechanisms. We need to work on this mechanism to try to find a way to have green finance. And I'm not speaking on, let's say, donation. It has to be, it can be some private public partnership you know, to support these kind of things. And I think this is almost my last one. Here we have some very good, interesting example about some document. The, the one on the left has demonstrated 100 methodologies to help incorporating nature-based solution on NDC. Buildings is not there. And on the right side, it is the same. It is another document. We have many, many tools, documents working on this issue. And just to say, the recommendation if you jump back to the ones of the global status reports, they are the same, all the same. And just to try to close now, we need to answer some questions. When we discuss with the guys, we make negotiation, regulation, we need to think, is project is sufficient to scale the market? No, so we need this policy framework. How can we go fast? We need to go fast, we don't have time. So now guys has to design something to be constraining enough not too much, but at least, and to be simple enough to encourage the transformation partners. And last point, we need also to have, let's say, this global approach, even if we know we will have black box now, but it's not a big issue. It will take time to develop a comprehensive set of data, but at least we need to encourage now already to start the process. And I think, okay, this is already done. I'm late. Thank you so much for your attention. Th thank you very much uh, for this uh, insight uh, in the NDCs and uh, how complex it is from this point of view. Uh, the good news is that uh, on the ground, I would say there are al already some solutions which are implemented and there are some, some knowledge, even if there is room to, to develop the skills and the capabilities. Uh, but from the, um, I would say, formal UN processes, uh, there is a lot to, to be done in, in the next uh, months uh, and years, so it will, it will give you, uh, for sure, s some more work. And, um, well, we, we, have, um, we are running out of time, uh, actually, because uh, it's already uh, te 10, and um, I, I just open the floor for one question, if uh, anyone has a question, otherwise uh, we'll have to, to wrap up, or if anyone from the panel would like to, to make a a final comment maybe on the link with the contribution to the next CDB, CDB the, the COP15, next month. Yeah, please. Maybe just one comment, especially to uh, your excellent presentation, Stefan. We, indeed, we, we have the solutions and it's not difficult, but I don't think everybody understands yet. Um, so we tend to have a technical discussion but like we have on the discussion of reducing emissions, ultimately we need to convince the people who own buildings, who occupy, who finance them. And I don't think we have that common language yet that they have some simple, first the understanding of what, what are the benefits and then how do we bring that into the measurement of their success in terms of the process of um, developing buildings, financing buildings, etc. So. I think there we need to still continue that simplification and translation. I think Roland, this is more than right. And just to give one example, because when we speak at least for policymakers, 
we need to explain also the co-benefit because for example even in the public sectors you, if you look for example in Senegal the cities are not paying the bill and they have public public buildings and so when we speak about transforming the patterns about buildings at the end it creates a lot of complexity at national level guys don't make bridge so we need to explain the calculation and at the end they will have benefits even by doing almost simple things to you know some planning issues some green issue about land so you, you're right we need to simplify it just to make big blocks working together and just to go and at the end we will fine tune you absolutely right so another way to say it it's uh, together for implementation <laughs> and uh, so we, with with these words uh, i would like to to thank you uh, our great uh, panelists uh, remotely and uh, also here in the room uh, and also all the people who attended uh, this meeting and uh, also to the technical team uh, which support us uh, t this morning and it was wonderful even if it was a little bit uh, noisy uh, around. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day and uh, can uh, follow the different um, side events on the GABC uh, website uh, in, in the days. Thank you. Have a good day.